بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم مائی ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس دس از ڈاکٹر محمد شفیق لیکچرر آف فلاسفی ایٹ ڈپارٹمنٹ آف اسلامک اینڈ پاکستان اسٹڈیز کسٹ دا کورس آئی ایم ٹیچنگ یو ڈیورنگ دس سیمیسٹر از کالڈ انٹروڈکشن ٹو فلاسفی اینڈ دا کورس کوڈ از پی ایچ آئی ون زیرو ٹو ان دس لیکچر ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ڈسکس وٹ امپیرسزم مینس and what is its role in epistemology. So let's move on. The outline for today's lecture is, or the points we are going to discuss in this lecture today are what empiricism is, or what do we mean by empiricism, what is the etymology of empiricism, and what is the history of empiricism, how did it begin, and what was the historical development of this school of thought. And then we'll move to British empiricism, which is one of the most prominent group of uh, people uh, in the history of epistemology in context of empiricism and then we'll uh, try to look into 20th century empiricism so this is the outline for today's lecture and now we move on to the next slide which is about what is empiricism Basically, uh, empiricism is a theory in epistemology uh, which explains or which strives to explain the source of knowledge. And as you know, uh, the epistemology is concerned with the source of knowledge. We try to look into uh, what are the sources of knowledge in order to look into the reality of knowledge in order to see what valid knowledge means and also uh, what is the employability of this knowledge. So uh, this theory which is called empiricism is a theory which says that all knowledge comes from sense experience. Uh, empiricism is a theory which states that knowledge comes only or primarily from sensory experience. The study of human knowledge along with other schools of thought in epistemology, empiricism basically emphasizes the role of experience and evidence especially that of sense experience. In the formation of ideas or the notion of innate ideas or traditions, empiricists argue that the traditions arise due to relations of previous sensory experience. So basically, empiricism holds that these are basically our sense experiences which form ideas in our mind. It's not the ideas which are innate in our mind. So they discount the, the, innate, the uh, concept of innate ideas that there are ideas which are innate to our mind, which are always there in our mind. So these ideas basically are produced by the sense experience. So whenever we have certain experiences, these experiences basically form the ideas in our mind. So it's not that ideas according to empiricist uh, ideas are all already there in our mind. Uh, it is not as such. Basically this, uh, these ideas are the product of our sense experiences. So, uh, in a nutshell, empiricism is the theory that says 
the origins of all knowledge is sense experience. So we have our senses through which we can gain the knowledge. It emphasizes the role of experience and evidence, especially sense, sense perception in the formation of our ideas and argues that the only knowledge humans can have is a posteriori knowledge, which means it is based on our experiences. And most of the empiricists also uh, discount the notion of that innate ideas that there are innate ideas lying in our mind. They, they deny it basically. And they basically hold that our mind is a blank slate and through these sense experiences we get uh, all the prints of the knowledge on, on our mind and that is how our ideas are formed. So it's not like their ideas are there already it's basically the experiences uh, which form these ideas. Now let's move on to the next slide and try to look into the meaning of empiricism. Basically the term empiricism is, is derived from obviously a Greek word empiric and empiric basically refers to a physician whose expertise is based on experience rather than theory or instruction. So it's not like uh, there is already a theory or uh, there is uh, some sort of a manual or instruction of uh, instruction book uh, which basically gives ideas to physician rather than it holds that a physician, an empiric is such a physician who has expertise, who has uh, vast experiences and has formed certain, certain kind of ideas or expertise uh, to treat people. So empiric basically means uh, experience through sense perception. It is also uh, derived from the Latin word experientia, the term experience, uh, which refers to obviously sense experience. So as we know that we have got these five senses, uh, uh, we, we are blessed with these five senses, a uh, sense of uh, taste, hearing, uh, t uh, touching, and seeing and smelling these five so all the knowledge basically is reducible to the data we have gained through these five senses someone might uh, say that well there are certain ideas which we have uh, and we do not have any sense experience of that for example uh, the idea of unicorn or for example the idea of golden mountain so these kind of things do not exist and we do not have experience of these so how do we form these ideas uh, the empiricists basically would respond to this kind of query as that although we do not have experience of golden mountain uh, but obviously we have experience of gold and we have experience of a mountain so these two experiences are combined together and in our mind and then it produces this idea so the foundation for the idea of golden mountain is basically provided by our sense experience. So all our knowledge is founded or based upon our sense experience according to uh, empiricism. Now we move on to the history of empiricism and we'll try to look into uh, how did it develop over the history and 
uh, who were the first uh, proponents of empiricism. So the first empiricists in Western philosophy were the Sophists who rejected the rationalist speculation of uh, Plato and company about the world as a whole and took humanity and society to the proper objects of philosophical inquiry. Invoking skeptical arguments to undermine the claims of pure reason. So, sophists are considered to be a kind of a, a formal uh, empiricist school of thought in the uh, history of Western philosophy. And uh, they also <clears throat> They posed a challenge to those uh, rationalists and they invited the reaction uh, that comprised Plato's philosophy, in fact. Basically, if you remember, uh, or Plato's philosophy was a rationalist philosophy and, and he believed in the world of ideas, uh, which we are going to discuss in detail in our next lecture. So, for the time being, we just need to look into uh, the history of empiricism and we need to uh, keep it in our mind that uh, the Sophists were the uh, first formal school of thought in the history of empiricism. Then, in medieval times, it uh, moves on to uh, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, these two medieval philosophers were great proponents of uh, empiricism. Uh, most of the medieval philosophers after St. Augustine took an empiricist position, at least about concepts, even if they recognized much substantial but non-empirical knowledge. The standard formulation of this age was there is nothing in the intellect that was not previously in the sense perception. And then uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in uh, 12th and 13th century rejected the uh, idea of innate ideas altogether. So both soul and body participate in perception for him. And all ideas are abstracted by the intellect from what is given to what is given to that by the senses. Human ideas of unseen things such as angels and demons and even God are derived by analogy from the scene. So it's not that these are the innate ideas according to St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, the concept of tabula rasa, or tabula rasa basically is a term which means that clean slate, uh, a white board you might call in, in modern times. So the concept of tabula rasa, or the clean slate, was developed by a Muslim a Persian philosopher, Avicenna, or Ibn Sina, and Ibn Tufail. In 11th century, uh, Ibn Sina, who further argued that knowledge is attained through empirical familiarity with objects in this world from which one abstracts universal concepts. So it was Ibn Sina or Avicenna who floated this idea that uh, our minds are tabula rasa or blank slate upon which we get all these uh, prints from our sense experience and then uh, we form ideas. Uh, and these can be further developed through a syllogistic method of reasoning. So basically foundation is provided by the sense experience uh, to our uh, mind, which is tabula rasa, and then uh, these form the abstract concepts, and then these concepts can be further developed uh, through syllogistic method of reasoning. Uh, 
similarly ibn tufail also demonstrated that the tabula rasa as a thought experiment in which the mind of fetal child develops from a clean slate to that of an adult in complete isolation from society on a decent island through experience alone so for him he basically he, he wrote a novel uh, ibn tufail in which he tried to uh, explain his theory of empiricism and he says that even if it's if a child is put in in an island where there is no theory is nothing to form no ideas at all but through his experiences there he will form the ideas and then by analogy his because his mind is a blank slate he will get all these ideas imprinted uh, on his mind through the experiences he gains there so uh, if we look into this uh, closely the muslim philosophers in medieval age has a very uh, deep impact upon uh, philosophy uh, in general and uh, in empiricism uh, in epistemology in particular and this is how uh, they transferred this idea to uh, europe and then uh, the europe developed this scientific revolution uh, which is obviously uh, still there and that has given a kind of boost to uh, western society uh, with the scientific revolution so anyhow we move on to uh, the next uh, one who was uh, uh, was called francis bacon francis bacon uh, was uh, a very famous Uh, British philosopher in in 16th century uh, basically uh, he's called renaissance philosopher and he preferred observation to deductive reasoning as a source of knowledge the empiricism of uh, francisian nominalist was more systematic all knowledge of what exists in nature he held comes from the sense though there is to be sure abstractive knowledge uh, the empiricism is empiricism of bacon differed a bit uh, with the, his uh, predecessors and he maintained that although there are certain abstractive knowledge or necessary truths but essentially the knowledge is gained through sense experiences his more extreme followers extended his line of reasoning toward radical empiricism in which causation is not a rationally intelligible connection between events but merely observed regularity Francis Bacon although did not deny the a priori knowledge but claimed that in effect the only knowledge that is worth having as contributing to the relief of human condition is empirically based knowledge of the natural world which should be pursued by the systematic indeed almost mechanical arrangement of the findings of observation and it is best undertaken in cooperative and impersonal style of modern scientific research bacon was in fact the first to formulate the principles of scientific induction so basically francis bacon is also considered to be the father of inductive method in logic or induction which is purely based upon observation and experiences uh, after 
uh, Bacon, then comes uh, another prominent name of Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes was a materialist and nominalist uh, philosopher, and he combined an extreme empiricism uh, about concepts which he saw as the outcome of material impacts on bodily senses with an extreme rationalism about knowledge of which, like Plato, he took geometry to be the paradigm. For him, all genuine knowledge is a priori, a matter of rigorous deduction from definitions. The sense provides ideas, but all knowledge comes from reckoning, from deductive calculations carried out on the names that the thinker has assigned to them. Yet all knowledge also concerns material and sensible existences since everything that exists is a body. On the other hand, many of more important uh, claims of Thomas Hobbes in ethics and political philosophy certainly seem to be a posteriori in so far. So his philosophy is basically a kind of extreme philosophy try to uh, try to bring a, a blend of oh, rationalism and experiencism, but uh, empiricism, sorry, but his empiricism was uh, that of a very extreme kind of uh, uh, empiricism in its nature. So uh, now we move on to, now uh, we move to another important topic uh, today's lecture that is about British empiricism. Uh, this is the group of those British philosophers who played a vital role in the history of philosophy to establish this empiricist school of thought uh, very prominently. And uh, the impact of that British empiricism uh, can be still felt today. So. Uh, Although there are uh, four uh, names in this slide, but the first three, John Locke, George Berkeley, and David Hume, they are considered to be the, uh, the titans of, of British empiricism and who established the empiricist school of thought in modern philosophy. And uh, that has a deep impact on philosophy. In the 17th and 18th century, the members of British Empiricism School, John Locke, George Berkeley, and David Hume, were the primary exponents of empiricism. They vigorously defended empiricism against rationalism of Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza. So we start with the, uh, John Locke. John Locke was an empiricist roughly in the same sense that Thomas Aquinas was, and he set the tone for the successors. His new era of ideas, as it was called, had its purpose to inquire into the original certainty and extent of human knowledge together with the grounds and the degrees of belief, opinion, and assent. Locke wanted to, to assess the certainty of our knowledge as well as its extent. On the other hand, George Berkeley, he was again one of the very famous philosophers of modern time, basically being a bishop. George Berkeley's main aim was to produce a metaphysical view which would show the glory of God. Being a bishop, he wanted to glorify the God. According to his view, there is nothing which our understanding cannot grasp and our perception can be regarded 
as a kind of divine language for which God speaks and He speaks to us. For God is the cause of our perceptions. There exists, therefore, only only sensations or ideas and spirits which are their cause. God is the cause of our sensation and we ourselves can be the cause of the ideas of the imagination. So there's a famous quote or famous slogan associated with George Berkeley and he contended that to be is to be perceived. That basically means if something cannot be perceived that cannot exist. So by perceived he meant the sense perception. And in order to justify the existence of God, he came to this conclusion. After Berkeley, uh, the name comes of that of David Hume. Hume was a distinguished philosopher, uh, and his philosophy basically is kind of very uh, unique philosophy, I would say. Although he was he was an empiricist and he's uh, one of the main pillars of British empiricism, but his philosophy was unique in a way that he has brought some revolutionary ideas in philosophy. Hume distinguished first between impressions and ideas. He further subdivided ideas into those of sense and those of reflection, and again into those which are simple and those which are complex. So basically he, he developed a system of empiricism while differentiating between uh, impressions and ideas. He denied the existence of anything behind impressions And a cardinal point of his empiricism to which he returned again and again was that every simple idea is a copy of a corresponding impression. Hume's main method on philosophy in philosophy was what he called the experimental method. So David Hume is also one of the main pillars of, of, of this British empiricism. And the last but not least is J.S. Mill or John Stuart Mill, who claimed that mathematical truths were merely very highly confirmed generalizations from our experiences. He sat down as founded on induction. Thus, in Mill's philosophy, there was no real place for knowledge based on relations of ideas. In his view, logical and mathematical necessity is psychological. We are merely unable to conceive any other possibilities than those which logical and mathematical propositions assert. This is perhaps the most extreme version of empiricism known, but it has not found many defenders. So although his uh, empiricism was quite extreme, but uh, unfortunately it couldn't go very long. So this is the, the British empiricism in a nutshell. Uh, now we move on to 20th century empiricism uh, and the result of this 20th century empiricism was in, in the shape of uh, pragmatism, logical positivism and skepticism. 
In late 19th century and early 20th century, several forms of pragmatism arose which attempted to integrate the apparently mutually exclusive insights of empiricism, experience-based thinking, and rationalism, the concept-based thinking. So basically, pragmatism tried to reconcile both and C.S. Peirce and William James, who coined the term radical, empir radical empiricism to describe an offshoot of his form of pragmatism, were particularly important in this India in, in the terms of, of pragmatism. And uh, this pragmatism in 20th century was basically the uh, result of uh, empiricism and uh, British empiricism. Another uh, offshoot of empiricism was logical positivism. Empiricism in the 20th century had generally reverted to radical distinction between necessary truths as found in logic and mathematics and empirical truths as found elsewhere. Necessary to, to confine by them however, to logic and mathematics and all other truths are held to be merely contingent, partly for this reason and partly because it has been held that the apparatus of modern logic may be relevant to philosophical problems. 20th century empiricists have spent it to call themselves logical empiricists. Logical positivism, basically, as we have discussed elsewhere in, in our one of the lectures, uh, that was a school of thought, a, a kind of a very extreme position, and they contended there are only two kind of meaningful statements, the analytic and synthetic. So analytic statements are those statements which are true by their virtue of, 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 of their very existence, like when we say all bachelors are unmarried. So the predicate already exists in, in its premise, uh, in antecedent. Uh, and the other kind of uh, meaningful statements for logical positivists were synthetic, which can be proven uh, through experience. Uh, so these two, without, uh, apart from these two kind of statements for them, uh, everything else was meaningless. So they discarded basically a metaphysical and religious uh, statements as meaningless uh, statements. Uh, another offshoot of, of empiricism was skepticism, uh, which basically uh, was performed by, by David Hume. David Hume brought to this empiricist viewpoint an extreme skepticism. He argued all of human knowledge can be divided into two categories, relations of ideas, that is, propositions involve, involving some contingent observation of the world, such as the sun rises in, in the east, and matter of fact, mathematical and logical proposition. And that ideas derive from our impressions or sensations in, in the face of this, he argued that even the most basic beliefs about natural world or even in the existence of self cannot be conclusively established by reason, but we accept them anyway because of their basis in instinct and custom. So basically, his stance was that there is no necessary connection between cause and effect 
there's only constant conjunctions. So it's mere uh, our experience which, which tells us that when there is a cause, it must have an effect. It is not a kind of necessary connection, but a constant conjunction. And this was also uh, the offshoot of uh, this radical uh, empiricism in, in, in terms in shape of uh, skepticism. So this is empiricism uh, for you, and these are the references. Uh, I would recommend you to have a look into these two couple of websites and these two books uh, for uh, further reading. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. Uh, you can use the WhatsApp or, or you can ask me the questions through KCMS. Uh, till next lecture, uh, take good care of yourself and your loved ones, and uh, I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you very much, and Allah Hafiz.